Hi there everyone and welcome to the webinar. I really just wanted to say thank you so much for joining me. Today's webinar should be around 40 minutes and I've got some really good goodies for you if you stick around towards the end. I'm really conscious of your time uh, so I want to make it quite snappy, just get to the punchy points but I'm really happy to answer any questions so I will try and do my best to take any questions as we go through the presentation so please just pop them in the chat box there. Um, so today we're talking about how to slow your Parkinson's down and the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because I've been running a program for people with Parkinson's for about five years now and I know the program works and I really want to get it out there. I want to see as many people as possible doing this program because it works. Um, I've been working with people with Parkinson's for about 18 years as a physiotherapist now. I'm a specialist neurological physiotherapist. And I have to say, I've never seen anything as effective as the PD Warrior program for helping you slow your Parkinson's down. So when we're talking about slowing your Parkinson's down, I'm talking about slowing down symptom progression and possibly even slowing down the destruction of those dopamine producing cells, which is absolutely huge. And as um, we currently know in the literature at the moment, there's no medication that can do that. So that's what I want to go through today. Talk about the 10 tips, the 10 takeaway points that you can use to help you slow your Parkinson's down. And as I said, I've got some goodies and an offer for you at the end. So I'd love you to stick around and actually um, have a look at what, uh, what we've got on for you at the end of the program. So I'm just going to reduce my screen so you can see my slides. I'll just move myself around. Okay, so today, um, we're going to talk about how to slow your Parkinson's down and the reason I want to do that is because I really want to help you improve the quality of your life and to really help you live your best life and if there's one thing that my patients have taught me it's that exercise, uh, self-efficacy, believing in yourself, building your support network and your community and really feeling educated and empowered is what's ultimately going to give you that best life uh, and that's really what's going to help you continue to, to smash that glass ceiling, drag out that bucket list, achieve those really brave goals and really live that life. And this is kind of the, the sense that I really hope you get by the end of this presentation. I probably had my light bulb moment um, very early on in the piece. I found a whole body of literature with a colleague of mine back in 2012. We thought we were at the top of our game of helping people with Parkinson's, but we started going through this literature and very quickly realized that we actually didn't know everything. Um, and there were a whole host of people that we weren't actually treating people with Parkinson's that were in the very early stages of Parkinson's. And at that point in time, traditional physiotherapy really didn't have the capacity to help people in the early stages of Parkinson's. So we didn't typically see them and we didn't really know how to help. But it was this emerging body of literature that really helped us to see that we need to see you as early as you are diagnosed. So as soon as diagnosed, we want to get you into the program so that we can help you keep the remaining viable dopamine producing cells alive as long as possible and slow further destruction and further symptom um, progression as well. Um, and I remember we'd been guinea pigging this new approach, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, in the gym. And I remember I was watching this gentleman. He was probably around 74. He'd had Parkinson's for around four years. He was medicated on levodopa. And he'd come in with his wife and he was really shuffly, walking with a stick. He'd had a few falls. And so we'd started using this approach on him. And I'd only been working with him for about 20 minutes. And I had him now walking up and down the same 10 meter line that I'd had it, that I'd assessed him on earlier. And he looked completely different. He was standing up quite tall. He had a really lovely arm swing. He was striding out and he had just a hint of a smile on his face. And I was really excited by this stage. And I turned to his wife. And she had tears running down her face. And I looked at her and she looked back at me and I said, what's wrong? And she said to me, oh my goodness, that is my husband. And I haven't, I haven't seen him in a really long time. And that was the kind of defining moment for me because I knew that as a physiotherapist, that was what I could really add to people and the population of people with Parkinson's. I could really make a difference. And this approach has helped thousands of people. We estimate about 20,000 people globally now that we've helped with this approach. And I'd love that to be for you as well and to really help you. And that's why I'm so excited about the program is I know it works. I know it can slow your symptom progression down. I'd like to think it can slow your Parkinson's down at the cellular level. And I'd really like to think that it helps you live your best life possible. So that's why I've got this lovely embrace life image here because I think that's what PD Warrior really personifies. 
So if we look at the paradigm shift, what we're really talking about at the moment, I mentioned before about tr traditional physiotherapy. So levodopa was first introduced in the 1960s and that was probably the first revolution in how Parkinson's was managed. So levodopa um, really changed Parkinson's from being a condition that was terminal, that you died of, to a condition that you live with. Uh, and my grandfather, unfortunately, was diagnosed with Parkinson's and in his very later stages, he, he didn't have levodopa um, and he, he was very dependent and lived a very rough life in the last four years of his life being nursed for all daily activities. And I know it was really hard on my grandma and she talked to me about how, how challenging it was for her. That's not the case now. We don't typically see people that are getting to that, that last end stage um, because levodopa is, a, is now a medication that you, you, you learn to live with the condition. How well you live with it though depends on so many other variables and that's what I'm going to touch on as well. The second revolution we saw was that of deep brain stimulation which emerged in the 90s um, and as amazing as it can be, it is, it's not without its risks. It's obviously a major neurosurgical intervention boring into the brain so it comes with risks of stroke, it comes with major risks of infection, um, there can actually be a lot going that can go wrong when you actually implant electrodes into the skull uh, and furthermore into the brain and as we see it at the moment it's really only still, um, there's only about 10 to 15 percent of the Parkinson's population that are eligible for deep brain stimulation even if you can afford it. So as remarkable as it's been it still only uh, serves as a very small proportion of the Parkinson's community. So what I'm talking about in terms of paradigm shift is this third revolution which emerged in about the two, 2010 when this, this large body of, of evidence started to emerge around the role of neuroplasticity and neuroprotection and that is what is so exciting to me is how important exercise can be and as a physiotherapist I know this, this is my bread and butter, this is what I do every day helping people to move better, to transfer, to, to be more independent. Um, and I, I feel that's an incredibly rewarding career for me, but I've never seen it in Parkinson's until about the last five years. And now that we're using this neuroplastic approach, I've never seen better people improve better than what they are now. So that's what we're talking about now is a paradigm shift. Not only are we seeing people a lot earlier, the approach that we're using is, six, is significantly different and that's why it's so effective in, in contrast to traditional, traditional therapy. So why is it so important that we get you moving as early as possible? We're just looking briefly at this diagram. As you might know, Parkinson's, the I guess the, the main characteristic of Parkinson's is the dopamine deficiency. Sitting within your basal ganglia, which is about the level of your ears, right deep in your brain, you have a little pocket of neurons called um, dopamine cells or dopamine producing cells and they sit within the substantia nigra pars compactor. And for reasons that we still don't know about, they start to deteriorate. And when they start to die off, there, there is this dopamine deficiency. And dopamine is an amazing neurotransmitter that, that services as a, as a modulator for other neurotransmitters within the, in the brain. Norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine to name a few. And when that balance is, is knocked off, that's when we start to see um, the characteristic impairments and hallmark um, signature mark, uh, impairments of Parkinson's disease which are poverty of movement so that bradykinesia, that slow movement that you that you typically see it might be something that bothers you it might be the tremor that bothers you the most or it might be the rigidity and the, the postural instability that comes with lack of agility and lack of um, quick writing responses and things like that and so it's this postural instability and the, the thinking slowly that are a result of the the dopamine deficiency within the system and we know that at the point of diagnosis, the majority of those dopamine producing cells have actually already perished. So anywhere from 50 to 80% of those dopamine producing cells have already died by the time you take yourself off and get a diagnosis from the GP, the neurologist, movement disorder specialist, whoever that might be. So what we're, what we're looking at now is we, we need to see you as soon as diagnosed because we're trying to protect those remaining dopamine producing cells from dying off and we can't do that with medication. There's no medication currently available that will slow that destruction down and not only do we want to slow that destruction down, we want to improve the efficacy of the remaining dopamine you have within your system. That's your endogenous dopamine that you naturally produce. We want to really amplify um, the absorption, the take up rate, um, keeping it in the system longer. So we want to make all those mechanisms that function in the brain as efficient as possible. 
Um, and we want to use whatever synthetic dopamine or agonist that you take as effective as possible as well. And the, the quicker we can do that for you, the slower we can, um, uh, or the more we can stop learned non-use effects, um, secondary impairments, fatigue, falls, all the things that might have uh, a more substantial effect on your quality of life as well. And so if you look at this diagram here, this uh, line represents dopamine, dopaminergic neuronal loss. This dotted line here represents non-motor symptoms. So as the um, as time progresses and more of those dopamine cells um, die off, you have a, an emergence of um, more non-motor symptoms. And of course, this thick black line here is more of the motor symptoms. And we typically say that it's the motor symptoms that would take you off to the GP, but I'm sure as you're aware, it's the non-motor symptoms that can often have the biggest impact on your quality of life. So starting exercise as early as possible, if not at diagnosis, what we hope to see is a, a change in the gradient of loss of dopamine producing cells. Now, we can't say that this is what conclusively is happening, um, but looking at human studies and, and plenty of animal studies where they've actually been able to autopsy animals after the intervention, we typically can't do that in humans. It's, it's frowned upon to autopsy people after the intervention. Um, but in in human studies, we're looking at um, medication uh, dosages, we're looking at how people move, uh, lots of different various variables which show a very compelling um, argument for the role of exercise in slowing the destruction of those dopamine producing cells. So we'd like to slow the gradient of decline at the cellular level. We'd also like to slow the um, increase and the effect of those non-motor symptoms. So to help you think faster, think better, maintain more of your memory, um, uh, maybe bodily discomfort, um, constipation, autonomic nervous dysfunction, all those sorts of things we'd like to address and, and reduce and dampen down the symptom progression. And likewise with your motor symptoms. And I would um, have said before, use it and uh, use it or lose it, but I think what we now know is if you get started on exercise earlier, you can use it and improve it. And with the PD Warrior program, you should expect to improve. That's how powerful the program is. And I'd go so far as to say, if you had, if you have idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is, um, I guess, essentially the purest form of Parkinson's disease. It's not a Parkinson's plus syndrome. It's not vascular Parkinson's, MSA, PSP, or any of the other Parkinson's isms. Uh, and you do the PD Warrior program the way it's designed, you should expect to improve and be in peak physical and cognitive condition by the end of the 10-week challenge, which is our signature program. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that shortly. But that's how effective this program is. So what I want to do now is go ahead and tell you the 10 tips to slow your Parkinson's down. And if you stick around to the end, not only can you get a summary of this, but I've got some goodies for you to, to listen in to as well. And as I said, I am going to take a couple of questions. So just pop them in the chat box and I do hope to get to them. If I don't get to your question or you're watching the recording of this, please just email me and I'm happy to get back to you um, as quick as I can as well. All right, so the first tip I'd say is once you choose brave, anything is possible. You have to make a conscious decision to be the best that you can be. And often that will be taking up an exercise program or committing to be the best that you can be. You have to make that decision. It's an active decision and it does take bravery and commitment as well. And I typically say, um, you know, you, you might be listening to this at the moment and think, yeah, yeah, I, I need to do that. I'll get started on that down the track. But that's actually not good enough. That that lack of taking action is not going to get you to where you need to be, to where you really can thrive in spite of and because of your Parkinson's disease. So the first thing I'd say is you really need to articulate to yourself, I'm going to be the best that I can be. You know, somebody once said to me that life is not a dress rehearsal and that's absolutely true. This is your one crack at the best life you can possibly have. And yeah, you've got Parkinson's and it sucks, but let me tell you as a neurophysio, there's plenty of conditions out there that are far worse than what you have now. And even on your worst day, I can guarantee there are people out there, people that I've worked with on a daily basis that would kill to have the amount of movement you have. You know, you've got one shot at this. Why not try and be the best that you can be in this real live event of your life? So what I'm saying is you've got to actively make that decision to be the bravest that you can possibly be and commit to being the best that you can possibly be. So that's step one. 
Step two is build your support team, your network of professionals and, and support body around you so that you can act on anything that pops up before it becomes a major um, deterrent or a barrier or a major issue for you. So just in this circle here, I've got some of the people that might be part of your um, health professional team. So your specialist might be your GP, your neurologist, your movement disorder specialist, somebody that's really interested in, in you and helping you to be the best that you can be is really important. Um, yes, they need to understand Parkinson's, of course, but I'd almost say they need to be extremely passionate about you because if they are, they're going to they're gonna go that extra length to really find out about you and what medications are new and what's going to be most effective for, for you. Parkinson's is a really complex condition. It's really heterogeneous, which means there's nobody the same as you nobody that presents the same way as you. There's lots of common characteristics, but the way that your program needs to be tailored for you with medication and exercise is specific and unique to you. So you need a really strong team around you. Obviously the physio who can guide you and direct you on exercise, um, aids and appliances if you need them, home exercise programs, uh, really lovely amplitude movement so you can function as well as possible, occupational therapists which can improve your daily independence, uh, speech pathologist if you're having difficulties with phonation or um, what's the word I'm thinking of, voice uh, projection, uh, they can certainly be helping you with that and swallowing as well if that's if, if that's problematic for you. Your Parkinson's nurse can often be the first port of call and can be fantastic as a resource to help you with your medications as well and lots of other education points. Nutritionist, there's lots of emerging evidence around the role of nutrition and how that interacts with exercise and your medications. So these are just, it's not an exhaustive list but it's certainly a really good starting list. Um, if you have the, you know, if you're in a situation where you can have this um, entire health professional team around you and I was going to say the word privilege but um, I don't actually mean that but it, you know it came to me as a, as a point the other day when I was at the World Parkinson's Congress in Japan and I met with lots of people that were in developing countries and they weren't in a privileged situation where they had access to all of these uh, health professionals. In fact, some of them hadn't even seen a neurologist or a GP. Some of them couldn't get their levodopa medication. If you're in a situation like that, this might be slightly different. But if you are in a situation and you've got the opportunity to have all of these people around you, please take that opportunity up. Um, it's really important that you've got access to as much as you can so that you really can live the best life possible. So that's point two. For point three, get your baseline measures. So this um, is really talking about the importance of your outcome measures and having something objective that you can measure yourself against. So when we do an initial assessment as a physio, what we're looking at is how well you move, what you can do, what you struggle with, what we think we should be able to prescribe to improve your daily function, your movement, etc. And then every six months or after or following an intervention, so for instance, the 10 week challenge, we would want to reassess you. A so we can see how you've responded to the intervention. So in this case, exercise, how you've how you responded to that, how we need to tweak that, but also how you're tracking. And, you know, we use lots of different standardized outcome measures to track your walking, etc. But we also like to see challenge tasks, things that you daily, you have issues with on a daily basis that we can look to improve as well. Um, and we typically say, you know, we want to see you every six months because that way we can get on top of any issues that you might have before they become really problematic. So every six months we'd look at a couple of those outcome measures that bother you the most to help you really keep on top of everything. Um, now let me just check if I've got any questions here. Yep, okay, all right. So, okay, Emma. So Emma's just said, I think this sounds great. Hang on, let me just pull it up again. I think this sounds great, but I'm not sure. I struggle a little bit with motivation. Is this going to be right for me? Great question, Emma. Look, I think if it's sounding a little overwhelming, then you may not be at that action stage yet. But for many people coming into an environment where there's a really strong support network of people that have been there where you are now that can support you, lift you up on the days when you're really struggling, celebrate your wins. That's what Tribe 365 is all around, all about. And that's what we include in the program because my patients have taught me that it's this peer support, um, the family support and then the health professional support all combined that really help you to get, get you through the program. And not forgetting that once you start on a program like this, getting a few quick wins in early can do enormous amounts for boosting your motivation, boosting your self-belief and really helping you to, to live your best life possible. So motivation um, is important. You need to be motivated to start. You need to be motivated to commit 
to be the best that you can be. But if you're wavering, I'd just suggest get started because this will come. It will really come with you. All right, let me just see. Okay, there's another question here from Tony. I'm 83. Am I too old to do this? Absolutely not, Tony. I'd say you're 83 years young and this is the perfect program for you right now. So as I said before, depends on when you were diagnosed as to how well you'll do in the program. And the reason I say that is the earlier you start, the better you're moving typically, the better we can help you to keep moving as well as you are now, but also um, to improve substantially and achieve some of those major goals. If you're a little bit further along in your Parkinson's journey, say 10 years, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't make amazing improvements that have a, a really significant effect on your daily activities. It might just be that you have to work at it longer um, and the goals might not be quite as significant, but it's never too late to start. So I would definitely suggest, I mean, I've seen people that are essentially wheelchair bound and, you know, for the large part of the day, we've actually managed to get them out of the wheelchair, getting back onto walking frames and things like that. Uh, and I'll show you some images of Carol later. Um, she was falling 15 times a day, was dependent on help to get her in and out of her bed, which was really not, you know, significantly impacting on her quality of life and her sense of independence, etc. And she did remarkably well in the program um, using these same concepts, um, but just a really good example of somebody that was a lot later stage. So Tony, I'd say 83 years is not is not too old by any means. Um, we've got people in the program that I've worked with that, you know, have been 96, 97. We modify for injury and for risk factor and for falls and all those sorts of things. So they are important things, but you're never too, eight, never too old to do a program like this. All right, let me crack on. So point four is to be aware of your type of Parkinson's and this is really important because as I said before, Parkinson's is really heterogeneous. There's no person that's the same of, same as you um, and one of the first ways that you can start to learn about tailoring your exercise approach is to learn what type of Parkinson's you have. So we've broken it into three different types so it's easy to, to digest and understand. The first one is bradykinesic and that is um, if you're slow and small and that's that's kind of the characteristics of, of Parkinson's that bothers you the most that typically means that you're bradykinesic in presentation and, and subtype of Parkinson's disease and that means that we would treat you with a program that focuses on amplitude on scale on exaggerating your movements on symmetry of movements and the reason why is over you might have been diagnosed two years ago but your motor symptoms have probably been subclinical for a lot longer than that, maybe five years. And it's over that five year period that your movements have progressively been getting smaller and slower, but slow enough so that you haven't actually noticed the change. And so now what you, what, how you move, the slow and small movements that you have now, they're normal for you. You've recalibrated for what is normal for you. And what we're trying to do is reteach you how to get back to normal functional movement. So you can pull on that cardigan independently. You can get the dishes out of the dishwasher. You can throw the sheets over the bed functionally, fast, efficiently, etc. So that's how we would train you if you're bradykinesic. If you're tremor dominant, that means that it's the tremor of your Parkinson's that bothers you the most or is the most significant impairment of your Parkinson's. And if that's the case, then what we would focus on is force use so really emphasizing the effort of the movement and we typically talk about um, achieving 80% of uh, your maximum motor output and when I say motor output that's quite different to cardiovascular output so when we when we talk about an intensive exercise pro program most people go to running marathons I've got a huff and puff and it's not that at all what we're talking about is increasing your drive from the brain to your limbs to really get them to push out with effort and force and so trying to teach you how to do that again will make you much more efficient and effective in how you move, how you write yourself in, in, a, um, in a perturbation or if somebody knocks you in a shopping centre or you step down unexpectedly, you know, all those sorts of things can really assist you if you're tremor dominant. Now if you're agility impaired, this is typically, um, this describes somebody that's had a fall in the last 12 months. Uh, or is a significant freezer as well. So that means that you're agility impaired and what we really need to focus on for you is your weight shift. 
so that you're not freezing as much. We need to work on falls prevention, which can be a combination of agility, it can be a combination of strength training, uh, flexibility, all wound up to help you reduce the amount of falls you're having or the near misses that you're having as well. So have a think about which one of those buckets you fit into because that would be the first way that we start to tailor your exercise program specifically to you. So that's point four. Point five is then to take up the challenge and to actually train brave. So our motto, which I'll show you a picture of later, is be, train, live, brave. And so the B we've talked about, be brave, means really committing to be the best that you can be, taking that active step. The train brave is all around doing a program that teaches you the neuroplastic training approach that we've um that we've pulled together as this package and then to actually do that and execute that over a 10-week challenge which is our signature program. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the approach that we use so that you know you kind of understand how it's different to normal exercise um, and, and how the 10-week challenge really wraps everything up into a really lovely package for you. So this is just an example of how the online 10-week challenge looks. So all the exercises are conducted by myself. We've got another trainer and then we have somebody with Parkinson's as well uh, coming along and doing the exercises. So we talk through each of the exercises, show, show you what it looks like, how to modify it, and then we go for it. And typically all of the exercises are two minutes, so you've got plenty of time to recover between them, uh, but also plenty of time to work really, really hard. So the, pro the approach that PD Warrior is founded on and underpinned by is called neuroplasticity. Now this, many of you will know this, but it's not a new term. It's something that we've used in neuro rehab for well over 20 years in stroke rehab, brain injury, uh, treating people with multiple sclerosis. But for me, I don't know why, but for some reason we never thought to introduce that into the way that we taught people with Parkinson's. And that's why as a physio, I've always felt really redundant helping people in park with Parkinson's because I never really felt that I could make a big difference to them. I never got that sense of professional reward. It was really hard going for me um, personally because I just didn't feel I could make that much difference to people. But with this neuroplastic training approach, now I know how significant our role can be and how important exercise can be for you. And I've just got this really lovely diagram here. So you can see the three different types of um, foliage on the tree essentially and what we're aiming for is to give you this really lush, rich uh, connection and branches and leaves and lots of activity going on in the brain um, and that can be a product of cognitive reserve, so um, making sure that we're accessing all of the cognition and, and brain functions and neurons and connections within your brain. It can also be a product of creating new connections between some of the neurons within your brain, um, peeling back some of the connections that are not as helpful or not as useful. Uh, it can be creating more vascularization, um, um, a supporting network to support more of the neurons and more of the connections between those, strengthening some of the connections. So what we're aiming for is to, to help you create this really lush foliage in your brain. However, the flip side of neuroplasticity, or basically neuroplasticity is your brain's natural ability to protect itself and to rewire itself in response to stimulation, environmental stimulation or cognitive stimulation or whatever it might be, exercise stimulation. So if you don't stimulate your brain uh, because you've become sedentary, you've got a lack of physical activity, you've withdrawn from social participation, you're not working anymore, any of those or all of those, what that actually means is that it becomes neurodegenerative. And you'll see over on the right-hand side over here, you'll see the foliage here which is really starting to prune back. Your brain is extremely effective at pruning back what it's not using. So if you're not stimulating your brain, neuroplasticity can be maladaptive and can start reducing some of the neurons in the brain, it can start reducing some of the connections that you're not using, um, brain function will slow down, you'll lose some of the supporting vascularization. So you know, you've got your two extremes over here, you've got neurodegeneration, you've got neuroplasticity which is you know growth and then you've got what we call sitting in the middle hut here, neuroplas neuropassive activity. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next slide, but basically we want to take you from wherever you are over to as close as we can get you to this beautiful lush foliage within your brain, which you know is um, characterized by new connections, strengthened connections, lots of supporting vascularization, new neurons potentially in some parts of your brain as well. And that's how amazing your brain is and how plastic it is. Basically, it can create all of this in response to the stimulation you provide it. 
but you have to provide it. You have to stimulate your brain uh, and one of the best ways to do that is with exercise. So the role of medication, as I talked about before, um, medication can't slow your Parkinson's down. So with this lush foliage over on the right-hand side, that is also shown by maintaining those viable remaining dopamine-producing cells. Well, exercise can help to do that, we think. We haven't proved that yet. It's not concluded in the literature, but there's a very compelling argument that medication um, won't slow that, that destruction of the dopamine-producing cells down, but exercise can. Deep brain stimulation, as effective as it can be for many people, doesn't slow your Parkinson's down either. It doesn't stop the, the dopamine-producing cells dying off. Exercise is really, from the literature, the only promise we've seen for slowing your Parkinson's down currently. Um, but it's really important that it's done in conjunction with effective medication. So when you go to your doctor, your doctor will prescribe your medication to you for the symptoms that you present with. It's a daily dose, multiple times per day for some people. Likewise, your exercise needs to be as tailored and prescriptive to you um, so that you get the best results as well. And overall, that's what's going to lead to your best quality of life and your best function. Okay, so it's the combination of um, medication and exercise that's going to give you the best function. All right, now are there any questions around that? Let me just have a quick look and see. Hang on, let me just go over here. Um, all right, Michael. So I exercise every day. How is this different? All right, so that might have been posted before the neuroplasticity. So... Any exercise is good, Michael, so it's really important that if you're exercising, congratulate yourself, pat yourself on the back because, you know, for many people that might be the first hurdle is actually getting into a routine to do consistent exercise. But the thing is that general exercise, so walking the dog or, you know, even running marathons if it's something that you've been doing for a long time, if it's not new, novel, cha challenging your brain to learn new activities, then it's probably not neuroactive or neuroplastic. It's probably more along the lines of neuropassive, which was that middle foliage sitting in the middle there. So neuropassive is when you're doing general exercise that's great for your cardiovascular system. It's probably really good for your respiratory system, for metabolic conditions like diabetes, keeping all of that at bay. But it's not good enough or not challenging enough for your brain to actually drive that neuroplastic change within your brain that's going to enhance your quality of life, your movements, slow down the destruction of those dopamine-producing cells. So neuropassive is walking your dog around the park. You know, it's great general health, but it's not enough to create that neuroplastic change. And I'd say that's what's the biggest difference around PD Warrior when you're looking at your general exercise versus tailored exercise, neuroplastic exercise, is, is that's how you're, that's, that's a big differentiator. And within neuroplasticity, there's seven different, um, I guess, factors that we need to cover off in your exercise program to make sure that it is um, as effective as it possibly can be for you. So those, you know, each exercise that we've created in Pity Warrior is not only functional, but it covers off the best way to really drive that neuroplasticity within your, within your brain. So Michael, I hope that answers your question. It's real, it is very different. It looks different, it feels different, and it, it'll give you better results than your general exercise program. But it doesn't mean you stop doing your general exercise program. Um, it just means that you need to draw from some of those PD Warrior concepts and put them into the way that you already play play your sport or do your activities. Um, and if you if you're playing golf, you know it might improve your handicap. I don't know. It might improve, you know that strength and conditioning might also uh, help as well, which is a lovely side effect. All right, so I just wanted to sh show you some of the research. Um, so this was a study produced by Rigel et al. in 2009. And this was one of the first pioneering studies that really looked at the effect of exercise, intensive exercise um, in people with Parkinson's. And what I wanted to draw your attention to over here was at the end of the eight-week intervention where they had people on tandem exercise bikes. So the person in the front of the tandem bike was a professional cyclist. The person behind had Parkinson's. And the person with Parkinson's had to keep up with the revolutions per minute of the professional cyclist, which basically looked like them cycling about 30% faster than self-selected pace. At the end of their eight weeks, they actually showed that they had a reduction in rigidity. So that's that stiffness that you often feel in Parkinson's of 41%, tremor of 38%, and bradykinesia of 28%. 
Now, they are remarkable results from an exercise intervention alone. And in speaking with a um, neurologist not that long ago, he actually said when we were talking about this study, those are the kind of results you expect to see from deep brain stimulation. So, you know, you weigh it up with exercise versus major neurosurgery, it starts to show a really compelling argument for the role of exercise because there's very little side effects related to exercise. Um, and then over here, this was also part of the study that they conducted and they did a pre and post. So beginning of the eight week assessment and then at the end of the intervention, they did another assessment. And what you can see here is um, there was actually a significant improvement in grip time delay. So the speed that they were able to execute a movement and the rate they were actually able to produce enough force for the particular task, that improved in both aspects in a completely untrained task. So they only did it at the beginning and then eight weeks later, but they showed a significant improvement in that fine motor control. And in the discussion part of the paper, what they talked about was the intensive exercise had actually made significant changes at the cellular and electrical level, which gave a systemic improvement overall. So what that means is training you in intensive exercise and a neuroplastic training approach can actually have a really significant knock-on effect to how you do your facial grooming, how you write, how you type, uh, how you do up buttons, you know, how you move in all everyday activity because it's a systemic improvement uh, in the way that dopamine is, is used within the brain uh, as a result of that exercise. So really powerful study that em emerged here and this has been further backed up by other uh, researchers, Petzinger, Fisher, um, J. Alberts, etc., who have all looked at different ways of creating an intensive exercise approach and the, the, the substantial improvements that people have seen. So let's have a look at no, another one. So this is the J. Alberts and colleagues um, study that was published in 2016. And again, I wanted to show you this to highlight the significance and importance of exercise. So if you look here, um, the UPDRS is a motor score that that is commonly used in clinical literature and basically it just looks at the impairments and the higher the score the worse the movement is, the worse the motor scores are. So here off medication, so not not taking medication, they've they've given it a, time, a period of time for a washout, you can see here that the UPDRS score was quite high off medication which is what you'd expect. And then over here on medication, so they've taken their medication and tested them again at 30 to 60 minutes after medication as you'd expect, the UPDRS score drops because their movement has improved. What's really interesting about this study is they also looked at another group of people that were off medication, so you'd expect their UPDRS score to be really high, but they measured them immediately after one episode of uh, forced exercise, so intensive exercise, and their scores are actually really closely um, to closely concentrated and better than those that were on medication. So again, starting to really see this compelling argument for the role and importance of exercise. Exercise is really, really important and has been so undervalued in the management of Parkinson's today. But we can see from all of these emerging studies how significant exercise is. We are designed and born to move, to move well, to have short bursts of intensive exercise. It's extremely protective for our brain, helps us think better and move better. So, you know, why we've dusted it under carpet and given it no importance is now, you know, in 2020 hindsight, we can see it, but we know now so much about it, it's negligent not to, to talk about it. Um, so that was motor, but I also wanted to highlight the role of non-motor symptoms. And this was a study done by Matt Ciselli and colleagues in 2018, just looking at apathy score in habitual exercises in the grey and uh, sedentary subjects in the black. And the apathy score, so that indifference, the general... Uh, lack of motivation, lack of initiation of any particular tasks is significantly lower in people that are, are habitual exercisers versus those that have, you know, very minimal physical activity. And likewise, depression scores are typically much lower in those that are habitual exercisers and uh, versus those that are sedentary. So, you know, considering that apathy, anxiety um, and depression are very prevalent in Parkinson's, it's really important again to improve non-motor scores by keeping yourself active. And we know from lots of other conditions that the more active you are, typically the lower your apathy and depression scores are as well. So another compelling reason to get moving. 
Um, all right, so this is just an example of one of the exercises in the program. So there's a lot going on in this exercise. Um, have a look over here at watch Leonardo as he's kind of going through the program as well. For many people you think, yep, I can totally do that. For others of you, you'll look at it and feel completely overwhelmed. But just remember that we teach you these exercises and then you've got the rest of the 10-week challenge to nut it out. And it's amazing how well people do over the program. Things that they think are completely undoable Aren't, can't possibly do that, but I'll give it a crack. And by the end of the 10 weeks, they're totally nailing it. Um, it it's absolutely amazing. So just have a look at this one. Oh, and I've just realized that you're not going to be able to hear me in this because I've plugged in the microphone. Um, but just watch what we're doing as we go through the example. So you can see here there's upper limb movements. There's lower limb movements, which increases some of the dual tasking. Uh, we've got really strong amplitude movements in the hands, very strong movements in the body, and we're trying to pull it all together with balance and agility and weight shift. So this is an example of some of the movements. So it does look a little strange. It's not like your regular exercises, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, and we typically bring in that dual tasking to really overtrain and stimulate novel uh, and new challenges for your brain as well. All right. All right, so point six is scheduled daily exercise. So as I said before, you might already have really good exercise behaviors, which is fantastic. Pat yourself on the back. But for many people, you're sedentary, and we know from the literature that at diagnosis, people with Parkinson's are typically 30% less active than healthy age match controls without Parkinson's. And what that means is that you're more prone to cardiovascular, metabolic, and respiratory diseases. And you really don't need to add that on top of your Parkinson's if you want to have the best life possible. So daily exercise is really important for general health. But the more you use a neuroplastic training approach, the better your function is going to be, your independence, your quality of life, your movement, and the way you think. So scheduling daily exercise is um, really important. Um, and just looking at some epidemiological supporting data here. So this was you at Al in 2010. And this was actually... Um, a study that they pulled from a larger study, but there were about 235,000 people that they looked at within this particular study. And some of the questions they asked them were changes of physical activities in relation to risk of Parkinson's. And they asked them how intensive their exercise program was in midlife, so around the ages of 35 to 39. And then how active and how intensive has their exercise program been in the, in the previous 10 years to when they were actually conducting the study. And what we can see here is the people that were not very active in the in midlife, excuse me, and were not active in the previous 10 years prior to filling in the survey, their risk of inc of getting Parkinson's was significantly higher. So if anything sitting on the line here is uh, a higher risk of getting Parkinson's disease. And they looked then in contrast to those that had exercised intensively in midlife and those that were still continuing to exercise intensively in the, in, you know, now in the previous 10 years. And you can see here that the risk of getting Parkinson's was significantly reduced. So that's a really good supporting um, feature here. Even those that were exercising at a medium intensity uh, had a, um, a lower risk of getting Parkinson's disease. One other point that I just wanted to draw your attention to was those that had an intensive exercise uh, regime in midlife, but had completely dropped that off later in life. And you can see here that because the risk of getting Parkinson's crosses this uh, straight line here. It basically just shows us that there's very little effect. So what that tells us is you can't bank exercise. If you've been relying on the fact that you were really active in midlife, but have kind of dropped it off later in life because you've been able to bank it, you can't. You can't bank exercise. Basically, your brain needs you to continue exercising in a moderate to vigorous activity to release all the neuro... Um, Neurotrophins like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, glial-derived neurotrophic factor, these are protective for your brain and what we think is what's actually leading to neuroprotection within the brain. You need to be exercising intensively for the changes in electrical activity to help that dopamine that you have left in your brain actually modulate other neurotransmitters. So you can't just let it go. You can't bank exercise. You can't just rely on the fact that you were really physically active in midlife. You need to keep exercising now moderately to vigorously to get the best results. Now, one caveat around epidemiological studies is we don't know whether people were exercising less later in life because they already had Parkinson's disease or whether that ex exercise actually 
um, stopped them or delayed them getting Parkinson's disease. We can't tell that from these sorts of retrospective studies, but what we can see um, is that if you've you know, if you're likely to have gotten Parkinson's, exercising intensi in intensively probably delayed the onset of that. Um, so you can kind of extrapolate a little bit to that um, in that degree. Now, Frazida and colleagues published this study in 2015, and I just wanted to draw your attention to it because it was the first study that actually had, you know, gave us a proxy for neuroprotection. And what they did in this intervention was um, they studied people for 24 months. They brought them in intensively for a month at the beginning, and they did exercise every day for a month or five days a week for a month. Then they left them to their own devices, brought them back for another block of four weeks, intensive exercise, and then, then left them for another 12 months. And at the end of that 24-month period, what they were able to show in the intervention group was they were moving better at the 24-month mark than they were at the very beginning of the study. So they, their movements had improved, and they measured that on that clinical rating score, the UPDRS that I mentioned before. So they were moving better. They were typically late taking less levodopa than the control group. And in fact, 75% um, of the people in the study who were the experimental group, 75% of those were still taking monotherapy, which was not levodopa medication. It was risagiline, uh, which is a MAO inhibitor. So 75% of them were moving better and didn't require levodopa therapy, which is the frontline medication to help you move better. Um, versus 20% of the control group uh, who were still on risagiline, the rest of them had moved on to levodopa. So that's fairly telling because, you know, neurologists, GPs, physicians, they want you moving as well as you possibly can about 80% of the time. And more often than not, it's going to take levodopa therapy to help you move as well as you can. If you're not taking levodopa, but your clinical improve, uh, UPDRS scores have improved, you're doing pretty well. Um, and of course, levodopa had only increased significantly in the control group. So this is starting to, to, again, give us a really fill in the gaps and give us a really nice picture of how important exercise is. Now, point seven is about living brave. So I talked about training brave. That's learning how to train effectively to slow your Parkinson's down, to move really well, execute really lovely functional independent movements. What do you do after that? And this is where we come to point seven because it's really about long-term behavior change and really helping you to to achieve those things that you didn't think you were poss you know you were capable of and this is just an example here of Will and his wife Will was diagnosed with Parkinson's it must be about nine years ago now and every year he and his wife have gone off and done a very long walk often up to 200 kilometers a year um, I think they've done nearly 3,000 kilometers between them since he was diagnosed and he does this because this is his goal to go and really challenge himself and to tick off those bucket list goals that he hadn't achieved yet and he's really living a fantastic life he's written a book since then you know he's living the best life he can because of and in spite of his Parkinson's and that's what we hope for everybody which is why we, cr we created that Tribe 365 community to really inspire you and learn from other people and, and build from what other people are doing with their lives living their best life with Parkinson's as well so I just thought I'd throw in a couple of videos here now you can't hear the audio for this, but this is Pat when she came in for assessment. She'd fallen three times before coming to see us and had recently fractured her hip. She was working as a theatre nurse and was just about to retire because she just couldn't function independently. She's about a moderate stage, we'd call her a stage three. And this is Pat at the end of week 12 and you can see how beautifully she's moving. And what's really lovely about Pat's story is not only did she stay at work, working as a theatre nurse after the 10-week challenge, she went back to playing tennis, which was the love of her life, and she'd given up and hadn't been able to play for a couple of years. So she really got a lot out of doing the 10-week challenge. So have a think about what, you'd lo what you've given up and what you really want to get back to doing. Um, now this is Carol, and I mentioned Carol before because some of you, you might be a little bit later down in your journey, um, wondering if this can help you. And this is Carol, and I timed her getting into bed. Now, granted, this is a plinth in the in the clinic, so it's different to her bed at home, but she requires full assistance to get into bed at home. And I've actually been timing her for about a minute, 20 seconds by this point, but I've cut it down for your viewing, just to see how she goes getting into bed and whether she can do it independently, and she couldn't. But it only took about 20 minutes, actually it was probably less than that, of teaching her how to increase her amplitude, the effort, the motor output, how to pull all those movements together 
to actually show her what she was capable of and give her the skills and the tools to be able to do that. She was then able to take that home and practice that in bed. And by the end of about three or four weeks, she was actually getting herself in and out of bed independently. And that was a major achievement for Carol. And she was much later along in her journey. And this was the lady that was falling 15 times a day. We were able to reduce the number of falls she was having and significantly improve her independence, which goes a long way to improving your dignity, obviously. Um, so again, you're never too late to do this program, but I would strongly suggest that you start as early as you can. Every day really, you know, time is life essentially because you don't want to have those dopamine producing cells um, dying off. Now here, um, I just wanted to show you some examples of the Tribe 365. So over here we've just got activities and goals that people are doing. So this was Ian who, a lovely guy, he actually was doing the park run and he was always able to do his park run under 25 minutes. When he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, he was back up to about 33 minutes. And I actually did an interview with Ian and I was talking to him about his park run and I wasn't sure which way he was going to go. And I said, well, what happened after your 10-week challenge, Ian? And he actually said that after the 10-week challenge, it was the only thing that had ever been able to get him back under 25 minutes. And so this was just some of the comments of what Ian had said. Um, Brenda, how effective the 10-week challenge had been for her. Um, back in 2016, so strange but effective exercises, so you can just read some of the comments there. Um, Try 365 because I know that I'm not alone and I think for a lot of people Parkinson's can be really isolating. You might have family and spouses and children but they don't really understand what you're going through and again I think that's what um, the Try 365 community is all around is all about is answering the questions that nobody else can help you with and really creating that community and that support. Um, lots of videos, lots of exercises, competitions, things to keep you motivated, accountable, challenged, um, you know, really important. All right, so point eight, oops, I've got that covering that. Point eight is rally the troops. And again, I can't underline this enough. Not only do you need your troops of health professionals around you, you also need family, friends, like-minded individuals, people that understand Parkinson's, people that you can connect with, keep you accountable, um, challenge you. It might be, you know, light-hearted competition, camaraderie, really, really important. Things that you can put in your calendar as events to keep you working towards something, you know, goals that you can look to achieve. Um, and I think this is certainly what the PD Warrior community has done. It's done it organically. In our clinic, we have, I think, 10 groups running a week, and we've got people that are still coming five years after we started the program, doing better than when they started five years ago. But they've also created this amazing community of people. They run their own support groups, um, and we just pro provide the wine and cheese, and they talk about what they've achieved, what their struggles are, um, what they want to celebrate, all those different things. The community is amazing. This is just Christine, who's over in Peru, who's done the Pity Warrior program. Um, some of the lovely people that I met at the WPC. Um, Cindy, who's been down to Antarctica after doing the 10-week challenge, one of her bucket list goals was to, to head to Antarctica. This is her walking through thigh-deep snow, although not quite here. Um, and then nine is educate yourself. So the better educated you are, the more empowered you are, the better you understand the theory, the more likely you are to stick with it. Um, some, some examples of how you can do that, although this has kind of crossed itself out, is the summit. So every year we run a three-day online virtual summit, which is where we've got 60 speakers, live panels, um, lots of education about what's happening in Parkinson's, how you can get involved, what's going on with the medication, with cures, all those sorts of things. Um, so you can get that from the summit. I've written a book which just underlines or goes through all the basic theory. So again, as I said, the better educated you are, the more empowered you are, the more you can build your own self-efficacy and DIY program. Attending events like the WPC if you can or local support groups, local education events, really, really important. And 10 is share the love. So when we did our um, first study of the PD Warrior program, we asked people whether they thought it was worth their time. 98% said yes, and they wanted to recommend it to their family and friends. Um, and 94% of people continue exercising after the 10-week challenge. And I think this is testament to how effective the program is. So unlike all the other programs out there for people with Parkinson's, not only do we do neuroactive exercise, so we draw from those neuroplastic training principles, we also look to create long-term behavior change. So it's not just 16 sessions, there you go, done and dusted. 
It's about creating that live brave mentality and supporting you at every stage of the journey so that you can really live your best life forever. And so the fact that 94% of people are continuing to exercise after the 10 week challenge, going back to their golf or their yoga or their tennis lessons or whatever it might be is actually testament of how effective the program is. And I think in large part that's due to the support network and the community that people um, are drawn into with the PD Warrior program and also the education that's provided. Um, I think they all go, all of those four things are four key pillars that we actively try and introduce into the program and it's what makes the program as effective as it is. All right, so if you've made it this far, thank you so much for your time. I think I've gone a little bit over. I actually don't know how long I've been chatting for, but I do tend to go off on a tangent because I'm just so, um, I guess, passionate about the program and how effective it can be. I'm just going to bring me back up here, over here. So how can you get started? If you're interested in this, then what I'd really love you to consider is the 10-week challenge. Um, and the reason why is because I want you to sh I want you to learn how to train brave. Once you've learnt this stuff, you can't unlearn it. You'll never go to the gym and um, just sit on the exercise bike reading a book. You won't do that to yourself anymore. You know that every single rep counts. And it's not about doing exercise all day, every day. It's about small incremental improvements in the amount of activity you do. And it's about doing the right exercise for you. And it might only take you 20 minutes, but you'll be far better off if you can start doing it sooner rather than later. So what does the 10 week challenge include? Well, it includes weekly exercise videos showing you how to exercise well and then how to tailor your program to your own personal needs. It gives you weekly educational content. Don't know if you can see me there, but I'll just put myself there. Weekly educational content so that you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Really, really helpful. Weekly motivation, which is crucial to keeping you on the bandwagon and helping you to create that support network for when you finish the 10-week challenge. And then the group and online coaching, again, to further, further tailor that program to you. And all of these things have created a really effective and powerful program that you can do online or you can do it visiting your nearest local facility of trained instructors. Now, what you also get with the 10-week challenge is the Tribe 365, and this is what really helps you to live brave. Of course, you can use it whilst you're doing the 10-week challenge, but it's really designed to help you keep kicking goals. It's there for the long game after you do the 10-week challenge, and you get 12 months access. We've got lots of guest speakers, interviews, experts, uh, a really amazing engaged community of support network, um, people posting questions, answering, supporting. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, daily Q&A support, we've got lots of coaches in there, myself included, who can help to answer your questions and we post lots of videos on different educational topics to keep you updated, lots of uh, exercise tips and things like that. Um, and then of course discounts because everybody loves a freebie. Um, and you can get all of that in the 10 week challenge. It's, it's a really, really amazing program and a lot of people tell me how what the value is, how good the value is. So I'll talk to you a little bit more if you're interested about the price. We do obviously have a webinar special, so if you've made it this far, you can actually take advantage of the webinar special by going down to the link at the bottom here. So we're asking uh, Australian dollars of $279. That's for professionally produced videos, education webinars and community. Uh, it will also give you 12 months to try through 65 platform. And once you're in there, you will not want to leave. Um, so you can get that at um, $99 off. Copy of the book. Um, which will save you some money as well and give you some bedtime reading if you're having trouble sleeping at night. Um, and then no risk. I don't want you to feel compelled to, to make a bad decision. So if you don't like the program in the first 30 days, you get your money back. So there's no risk to you at all. And the reason why I've done that is because I don't want there to be a barrier. I don't want there to be a reason why you don't get the best out of your life and don't live your best life because you're scared to make that decision. I want you to commit to live the best life that you can and this is definitely one of the vehicles that you can use to do that. So the crossroads, they're here now. For many of you, you'll be ready to act and sign up and we have at the moment about 100 people coming into the online program each month, which is amazing. I'd love that to be you. You know, the testimonials are there. The testimonials are amazing. People have done extremely well in the program, and I'd like to think the same of you. You should expect to improve doing the 10-week challenge. You should expect to be in peak physical and cognitive condition at the end of the 10-week challenge. You should be thinking better, feeling better, moving better. People will be commenting on how well you look. You'll be thinking of new goals that you can achieve. You know, if you've 
crushed and put that bucket list program away, you can drag that back out and start writing down some of those brave goals. You know, people have done the 10 week challenge and gone on to do absolutely outstanding, amazing things. And some people have just been able to make the bed again for the first time in four years. You know, it really covers the complete spectrum. So it just depends on what you want to achieve in your life. Um, so you've stuck around to the end, so here are a couple of extra bonuses. Again, everybody loves a freebie, so please go down to the link at the bottom there if you want to get the 10 tip uh, PDF, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, summary of those 10 tips that I've just talked about now. Uh, again, you'll get a free copy of the, um, the book that I've written, which is an Amazon bestseller, and you'll get that if you sign up for the online 10 week challenge and you'll get the 30 day money back guarantee. There's no risk to you. If you don't like it, if it doesn't blow you away and change your life, then you can get your money back. And I'm real, I'll be really surprised if it doesn't do it if you follow the way, if you follow the program. I know it'll change your life. All right. So in summary, our mantra is to be, train, live, brave. Think about those words. Are you living brave? Are you living the best life that you can be? Because I would love that for you. I think with Parkinson's now, how well you live with Parkinson's is completely up to you. You know, you could live the best life possible and I would really love that for you. So please sign up for the 10 week challenge. You get all of that included. Happy to answer any of your questions. Like I said, if you're watching this as a recording, please just shoot me an email. It's melissa at pdwarrior.com. Shoot me through your questions. I'm really happy to answer them and I really look forward to seeing you on the other side in the 10 week challenge. Thank you.